I don't know. I'm gonna check in a second. Okay, I'm gonna let you know. Okay, okay. just wondering. Thank you. I can't Good evening, do Mr. Burroughs. This is uh, Councilmember Reynoso here. I see that. Is that Chair Fuller? Yes. How's everybody doing? Doing well. Doing well. Hi all. Good. Fine. Thank you. All right. I don't have control of the mute function. I don't. Is it Jerry or Joanna? Who's at the office? It's always me. Okay. Just wondering who's there. Um, the attendees can mute and unmute themselves. Right, but I just wanted to know who was because originally you had to turn me on so I could get in there. All right, so you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, we're doing good. Now I can't monitor the chat and the participants all at the same time. So committee committee members can. Somebody offered to keep an eye on chat things that they don't get out of control. Anybody? Hey, again, Tom, what are you asking for? Well, there'll be questions and such coming up in the chat. And if I'm paying attention to people speaking, I may not see them. Okay. So I could, I could help with that, Tom. Okay. You know, because. Last night, uh, Rob kept track of who was coming in the room and what order they were coming in, and it's just just trying to keep track of it and not lose people because there's so many little boxes to keep an eye on. All right, so I have committee members myself, Gina Argento, Bogdan Bakarowski. Uh, Oh, wait, is Gina here? No, Gina's not here. Is that Gina? Gina's here. That's Gina, because just Gina. Okay. I'm here. Gina Bauer. All right. Oh, two Gina, sorry. Okay. Is Lisa? Is Lisa here? Here. Okay. Gina Barrows. Teresa Gianciata. Gio's here. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, Indig. Rosina Kaminsky. Katz. Landau. Marie Lianza, you're here, yes? No? Did I see Marie? Lisa, do you know if Marie's coming? I'll text her. Okay. Dana, Marie, and Roger, Roger Capucci is now a public member. So, um, I don't know that we're voting on anything tonight, but uh, if it has to be a quorum, the public members count as members for the committee actions. And today we have a to clarify that's a non non board member. Correct. That, that's what you mean by public member. Yeah, got it. Okay. Thank you. That was some unattached voice, but, um. So, we have a, very, a relatively short agenda today because it's we had it's not 1 of our regularly. Scheduled four scheduled meetings of the Pardon year. Me, I didn't hear you call my name. Okay, there's a voice that's not attached to anything. So it's your friendly neighborhood, Maria Vieira. Oh, I sort of got you. You, I did you after Dana, then Maria. So yeah, you. I got you. I got you marked as here. Great. You're here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank You're you. here. Thank you. uh, and. Council member Reynoso is out there somewhere hiding in the crowd. There he is. I'm okay. here. I'm here. I got a bright yellow shirt so you could catch me, Tom. So now Aaron Drinkwater, who's a member of the community board and is on this committee, is right there. So and we were asked by Yuri to invite um, herself, uh, Yvonne Ballard, Cynthia Tata, Carol Rubenstein, Claire Harding Keith. Valerie Barton Richardson. So I think I saw some of those people when I was going through the boxes. So let's see. Carol Rubenstein is there, who's from Canva, right? Cindy Tata is there from DHS. Aaron is there. Valerie Barton Richards is from Canva. So such a weird thing to have to do. 
Yuri is there from DSS. Erin is there. Okay, is Yvonne Ballard here? Yes, there she is. So, okay. So the first Marie item- is, Marie is coming yeah. on, she said. Okay, great. Okay. All right, we'll just make sure everybody's here. All right, so um, we were contacted by um, DHS about the year opening a new facility at 39 Ainsley Street. So um, we decided to have a committee meeting so the committee could hear from DHS and CAMBA about the facility. And um, do you want to, is you in charge of this, Erin? Is this going to be your show or is it going to be um, yours? I'll, I'll kick it off. Um... And then we'll turn it over to Canva so they can do a presentation and answer some questions that the community board might have. And if there are questions that our DHS staff, including Yuri, the Brooklyn Borough Director, can answer, we'll certainly have them chime in as well. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Welcome, Council Member. It's nice to see you. Um, we notified on this site back in July, some time ago. I know it was over the summer. Um, and we wanted to circle back to the community board prior to the site opening um, to provide some additional information about the location, about how clients will be assigned to that location, and then have an opportunity for our provider, Canva, to give some details on the services that will be provided to clients um, at that location. So as a reminder, uh, the location is 39 Ainsley Street. Um, this will be a single adult uh, shelter for single adult men. There will be 141 individuals served at this location. Um, as a reminder for folks on the committee, for our elected partners, um, when individuals are seeking shelter, they come to 30th Street Bellevue, which is our single point of intake for men. Um, from there, the men are assigned to an assessment location where we learn a little bit about the individual. Um, at intake, our first goal is always to convert an individual from shelter. If there's an opportunity to preserve an existing housing, if there's an opportunity to connect them uh, to housing in the community uh, that might be available with friends and family, we like to do that. Um, but we also start our process at intake in terms of learning about the individual, um, and the constellation of reasons that they might be coming to us seeking uh, services. Um, at that point, they're assigned to one of four assessment shelters. Um, assessment typically takes anywhere from 20 to 30 days where we learn about the clients. Um, a biopsychosocial is completed, and this is really aimed at addressing the underlying issues um, that somebody is coming to us seeking services. Um, we have different types of shelter available for our clients across the system. Um, we have shelters that specialize um, in job readiness and employment. Uh, we have shelters that are geared more to individuals who have substance use or mental health diagnoses, and this might be a contributing factor to their homelessness. And then we have what are called uh, general shelters, uh, population shelters. Um, each of our programs have different types of staffing models based on the client population that they're serving. Um, and we also have 24 hour, uh, seven days a week security on site for our clients. Um, clients are then assigned to a program shelter. The uh, location on Ainsley Street will uh, be a program shelter uh, that is operated uh, by Canva, as I mentioned. Um, and our goal is to open in uh, mid to late 2021, which is why we wanted uh, to have the meeting with the community board, given uh, that this location uh, is set to open in the near future. Um, with that, I will turn it over to our colleagues at Canva to really talk about the program that's going to be on site for our clients at this location, uh, for them to introduce uh, some of their uh, colleagues from the organization and to talk through the programs and the services that clients might, uh, that they'll be able to, to take advantage of while they're in shelter. And then we can certainly pivot back to answer any questions from the community. Thank you, Erin. Uh, thank you, Erin. Um, I'm here, Tom. Okay. <laughs> I see, thanks, I hear Tom. you. Okay. okay. All right, thanks. I'm sorry. No problem. 
So good evening. My name is Valerie Barton Richardson. I'm a chief administrative officer at Canva. I'm going to kick us off and talking a little bit about Canva and what we do. And then my colleague, Claire Harding Cape will talk specifically more about the services uh, at 39 uh, Ainsley. Um, Canva is a nonprofit organization. We've been around for 44 years. Uh, we have services in a broad array of areas, everything from economic development, small business services, workforce development, after school camps, infant maternal health. We have a strong portfolio in housing stability. We are a home-based provider, not for this neighborhood, but we are a home-based provider. So we look both at homelessness prevention, eviction prevention, as well as temporary housing for folks when they need shelter. We are a shelter provider. Um, we are also a affordable housing developer through our affiliate Canva Housing Ventures. And we've developed over 2,000 units of affordable housing throughout New York City. So we look at the continuum. In shelter services, we have been operating shelters for 25 years. Uh, our first shelter is the Park Slope Women's Shelter. We currently provide shelter 700 units of single adult shelters, and we also operate six family shelters throughout New York City. Uh, our approach to shelter is that we care about New Yorkers. We care about our fellow New Yorkers. We're about making sure that folks can get back on their feet if they have to go into shelter and take that time to help skill build and work with them to return to housing that is a good fit, that they will be prepared to be good neighbors when they are moving back into permanent housing and that they don't return to the shelter system. So that's a big area of focus for us. The shelter that we're proposing that we will be opening uh, on Ainsley Street, as Aaron said, is 141 uh, beds for single adult men. And our focus at that site is job readiness and employment. So we hope to bring our strength in doing workforce development, which we have done for years, into the shelter setting. Um, and the last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn it over to Claire, is we are very invested in being a good neighbor. Um, you know, Claire will talk a little bit later about our community advisory board and what we do to both prepare our clients about being a good neighbor, but being a good neighbor in, in the neighborhood. So that is, that is something we are very um, particular about. Claire? Thanks, Valerie, and thank you, Community Board One, for the invitation. Um, we take our responsibility as shelter providers um, exceptionally seriously, so we um, welcome this opportunity to meet um, some of the leaders in the community and um, we'll continue to, as um, Valerie mentioned, through a community advisory board, be very interested in not only providing information on our services um, and some of the achievements our clients are making, or we as a program are making, um, but also listening to any concerns in the community. Um, it's been said this is an employment shelter. We received the referrals from the Department of Homeless Services, and we um, expect the residents to be employment ready or perhaps working. Some of our clients uh, work untraditional jobs and hours. Um, so, you know, I don't know that we can expect them to be a nine to five schedule. Um, and then some will be ready for employment and not currently gainfully employed. And we will be working with them to uh, get employment so that they can successfully exit to permanent housing in the community. Um, we will have a full staffing pattern of 
case managers, housing specialists, employment specialists, and a job developer to assist um, in that endeavor to move the clients to um, permanency and to jobs. Uh, we will also have a recreation coordinator that will work with the clients. Um, we will have a computer lab and Wi-Fi on site. Um, very much using a team approach across our disciplines, including our operations staff, who often have the best uh, information about our, cl our clients. Um, because we will be staffed with a supervisor 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we'll also have security guards um, through a contract um, to be determined uh, with the security company. And uh, we also have residential aides who provide some of the kind of housekeeping and support um, around living in the facility. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the program. Um, we're certainly happy to take questions. Uh, so, Ms. Martin Richardson, you're the Camba, the bigger organization, correct? So, uh, so the the CEO of Camba is Joanna Plusto. Uh, Joanna Plusel has been our CEO since our founding. Um, I report directly to Joanne. I have a number of program portfolio areas, one of which is all of our shelter programs. So okay. Okay. I oversee our shelter programs. Claire reports to me. Carol Rubenstein, who is on the call, reports to Claire, and Carol works with all our single adult sites. Uh, we've opened every shelter for Canva. We opened the Park Slope one together. I've been in Canva, you know, we stay at Canva a long time. I'm a Canva baby, 25 years. I think Canva, okay. Claire's actually okay. older than I am. Ha ha. Um, no, I, I, I know Canva's been around forever. So, you know, Church Avenue's been around forever. That's right. <laughs> but what so. What perhaps you, did not make clear is that there will be an on site director. Well, I'm trying to get the team the tree. of this administrative is, staff. Yes, I understand the that. Shelter programs person, and then you're the single adult site person. So, do we have, well, you're not opening for a while. So, do you have somebody targeted to be the manager of this site yet or not? Uh, we have some ideas, some internal ideas. We don't like to open a new facility with all new staff. We like to bring some of the veterans from our other facilities who know our um, policies and procedures. Um, so we have some ideas. There'll be a director of security and operations, a director of social services, a program director, and an assistant director. Okay, because you know when it gets to being open, we're going to need like a contact number and you know, to reach out to the neighbors. Now, there was a mention of the neighborhood advisory board. Um, I've had good and bad, you know, experiences with neighborhood advisory boards. You know, the the um, family shelter on on uh, Greenpoint has one. I don't know when they've met recently. The one that's for the men's assessment center meets on a quarterly basis, but um, will you be having a neighborhood advisory board and how are you going to set that up? And Yeah, we definitely will be having one and we will um, solicit interest from this group and others in the community, uh, local merchants, um, other providers in the community or other businesses in the community. Um, the contractually, we're obligated to have them quarterly. Um, Canva has always had aired more towards a monthly, but we will take the lead from the community on um, what their interest is. Um, so, yeah. Well, well, my experience is it gets, there's a lot of interest at the beginning and then it begins to peter off. And then some of the agencies just then said, fine, it's petering off enough to deal with those people. And I would think it's a little bit of better interest to keep encouraging people to come and be aware yeah, of what's we going do. on. We have been we you know pivoted to zoom meetings and all of our facilities have continued to meet with or conference calls um have continued to meet with all of our um community all of our community advisory boards have met 
um, during the pandemic and prior. Some of them are quarterly because there is less interest in some neighborhoods. Um, most are monthly. Uh, committee members have questions. Raise your hand. I have, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, whose voice for, is that? For, for jumping to jump. All right. Um, I don't know if we can do the raise your hand thing in the participants list or put your hand up and I could see. Yes, see. Um, uh, so did you hear me? Tom? Yes. I said I had a oh, question. Whose, whose voice? Is, I can hear a voice, but I can't attach the name to Maria the voice. Viera. I don't know it's Maria Viera. Okay. It's Maria, Tom. where are you? I'm, I think that my connection is glitchy because I'm in transit. As soon as I, I'm stationary, I, I think you'll. You're riding there. around in your car. No wonder I can't see you. Okay. So My Maria team. Vieira has a question. Go ahead, Maria. My question is, and, and thank you so much for your presentation, Canva. You're a very reputable organization. Um, and you have been in the community for many years and you do a lot of good work. So, um, I mean, I'm, I, I'm not a person to speak out of two sides of my mouth. So I'm not going to say that I reject the idea of a shelter, but I am going to ask this question. I've never heard of, of the concept of an employment shelter before. So I, I heard you said that it was career pathing, and but I want to know what is the success rate for securing of, 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 of job secure securement for the residents of these shelters? Um, there are other employment shelters in the DHS system. I, uh, this is Canva's first opportunity operating, so we don't have a track record in this. As Valerie mentioned, we do have workforce development programming. Um, but I cannot speak to, you know, we don't have a track record yet. Um, uh, the people from DHS, can you speak on? The employment shelter similar to uh, just one break, perhaps is it just one break. No, what is it? Um, the, um, no, that's not its name. Uh, the one that's over. I'm not sure which, which facility you're talking about, Tom, but we do have employment shelters the one, across the, the one that, that all the business improvement districts hire people from. What is that called? The Doe oh, Fund. The Doe Fund. The Doe <laughs> Fund. Yes. That's, yeah. isn't that an employment shelter system? Yeah. And it, um, it's been in our neighborhood forever. Organization. That's right. Different organization. Um, so we have employment shelters um, across our system, uh, primarily within the single adult system. Um, and again, it is working with providers in terms of the types of programs that they provide on site clients, as well as on uh, off -site, off site connections um, through workforce development programs uh, and so on. But I believe the Dodo fund, for example, has the vans come in the morning and take people to different job sites and then they come back at the end of the day. Um, are, uh, do you believe, Canva, do you know, are, you, are your people going to be going to jobs in the neighborhood? Are they employed individually? Do you, do you scope out and find employers for them? Make sure they're in supportive employers, uh, you know? I just in general, know how to work and yeah, just so one thing I think it's important to point out in this we see both on our single side and our family side, a number of folks are already working, right? So they may be in our homeless shelters, but they're also working. Um, so we may get folks who already have employment, and I think that is the assessment is to see where are they already connected and then doing the assessment of their strengths and skills if they're currently not employed what their employment history has been um and working in like i said in our workforce development programs are also a coalition with the new york city training and employment coalition so really looking for what is the best fit for the individual in terms of their employment trajectory and then whether that is on site uh, training programs are often off-site training programs, and particularly that we are still in a, pandem a pandemic, you know, a number of those training programs are now fully remote. So, you know, our, our, our goal is to link folks with the employment resources that are there and, and work from their strengths and take a strengths-based strength -based approach with our clients in terms of linking 
uh, them to employment if they currently are on it. Teresa, did you have a question? You need to unmute your microphone. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, <clears throat> I just want to say <clears throat> that uh, in the early 80s, <clears throat> the city actually placed uh, several hundred men at the, at the old Greenpoint Hospital. And then that number escalated throughout the years to over a thousand. And it took the community and the planning board to work in that area to try to uh, lessen the figure because there were a lot of problems in the community throughout the years. A lot of burglaries, there were a lot of harassment, there were issues. So I can understand there is an article, actually the homeless men, they hit, they hit a record, it's in the daily news, and there is pro a problem now, but I wanna know, you're starting off with 141 homeless men. Is that gonna be capped at always at 141 or is that gonna be escalated as as it had been early, in the early 80s and it took many years to lessen that figure? I mean, that's a concern. Because no, you started, so you started so, at 141, and then it, it could go beyond that. And I don't think that's fair to our community. We've had yeah. issues in the past, and we were able to work with the homeless shelter and the services and our council people there, and we were able to lessen that figure. And it was be much better for the homeless and the, the community at large. So that's my question. Is it going to remain at 141? Or is it going to escalate to over a, a very large amount of people? Because that's it, going to be a burden on our community. Thank you for the question and the opportunity to provide some some clarifying information. So no, that will that will not increase. Um, the contract with the organization is to provide the services for 141 individuals at this location. Um, so that will not uh, increase. Um, there's also um, local law that prohibits the agency from having uh, shelters uh, that are larger than 200. Um, there are um, examples of grandfathered locations, but that's not the case here. The contract with Canva is for services for 141 individuals, um, and that will not increase. Hi, this is Council Member Reynoso. Um... Can I can I speak for a second? Yes. Um, so first, I just want to thank everybody that's taking time out of their day to be here on this important issue. I just want to uh, thank you all. I want to thank DHS and Canva and everyone that's here as well um, to answer the questions of the community. Um, the first thing I want to say is that I'm extremely disappointed with DHS and the work that this administration has done to continue to pile on homeless shelters into our community. Our community handles more than 1,400 um, people in shelters at the current moment. Um, we don't have more than 1,300 people whose last known address is from our district. So I wanna be very clear that we are already an overburdened community when it comes to homelessness. We're already doing our fair share and we've surpassed our fair share a long time ago. I've had community, I have had conversations with the Department of Homeless Services over the overburdened um, work that they've done in our community. Since I've been a council member, I've taken on four to five shelters and about two hotels in my in my time. You've never heard a peep from me um, regarding these issues because I think it's extremely important that we take care of our, our, our most vulnerable population. You would never see me be a proponent against um, against the people that need homes um, and, these, and these homeless shelters, but they've done too much. It's been almost six shelters since I've been a council member. And they keep abusing their my policy position and my want to help homeless people. They abuse it by continuing to add more homeless shelters into our district. They know I'm not gonna fight it. They know I'm not gonna rally. They know I'm not gonna be out in front stopping it from happening because I care deeply about making sure we take care of the most vulnerable. And because of that, they continue to give us more homeless shelters. So that is um, partly, um, uh, not a, I don't see it as a burden. I see it as a responsibility that we take care of our folks. So it is why we're seeing another homeless shelter in our district. It is why hotels pop up um, are supposed to be temporary and last longer than they have to. 
Um, at this point, DHS has lost all confidence with me and being able to work with me as a council member um, and have any meaningful and serious conversations because all they do is continue to burden us with more shelters. And again, they, they've abused my kindness um, at this point. So I'm livid, I'm very upset about what's going on. But saying all that, my stance does, is, is unwavering. I care deeply about taking care of a homeless population. The city has done a terrible job at managing the homeless crisis, but that is not the fault of the 70,000 people that if they don't have these shelters, end up having to sleep on our streets um, and don't have any place to go. So you won't see me rallying. You won't see me fighting in front of the shelter. You will never see me do something like that as your council member. I wanna be very clear. I care deeply about taking care of our most vulnerable, but it seems like my policy position has been taken advantage of and have been and I've been thrown more homeless shelters than I can even comprehend or manage. While other portions of community board one, and I want to be very clear, the other side of the BQE, hotels are shutting down, right? And are being moved to other places um, or are not being are not going up. The you Steve Levin is the council member that um is the chair of the committee that would oversee this work and has taken a fraction of the amount of homeless people that I've taken in my section. And it is not by chance that the portion that I represent of community board one is mostly black and brown, and the portion that he represents is more affluent and white. So at this point, what I am saying is that I am frustrated. I am livid. My anger, I hope you can see my anger. But because I am who I am, and deep down in my heart, I care about taking care of the most vulnerable, you will not see me challenge this homeless shelter in Ainsley Street. Um, I will love to have a conversation about mitigation and what we do to make sure that the environment that we provide to the residents in and around this shelter and inside this shelter is the best environment that we can have and that we can have a balance here in this community. But again, I just wanted to make my position very clear on where I stand. And again, I uh, appreciate everyone for giving me the opportunity to speak on this issue um, and for for coming as volunteers, um, and, you know, volunteering your time to be here to listen to this important issue. Thank you. And I'm more than happy to have more conversations about this. Wait, who is speak? Who just was? It's Maria. Who, who's doing loud applause? It's loud applause. Okay. All right, it's Antonio. 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 I'm here. I'm here, Tom. We put in a lot of hours on this issue at every one of our meetings, and it comes up at the community board meetings. And we go out and we stand on the street and try and figure out what's going on. But um, we could use a little help and a little consultation once in a while as to, you know, what the issues are. I mean, I could get a whole crew of people coming from the other side of the BQE talking about the McCarran Hotel, a women's shelter that took in the shelter that burned down in the Lower East Side. Um, the family shelter that's on Greenpoint Avenue, the men's assessment center. I mean, we, we can't be, you know, talking about numbers unless we know what those numbers are. And we volunteers on the board don't have access to all of that. Um, and if you do and you share it with us, we can try and formulate ways to get around it. I mean, this is the fair share thing has been around since 19, the, seven, the 80s, you know, when it's um, the, the I, I, I agree, Tom. And so Tom, I would say this. I don't feel like the 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 burden should fall on the community board to build a fair share system. It should fall on the Department of Homeless Services. It should fall on on me and the mayor. And what right. I try to do is is put. Not, I'm not blaming the community board for any of the work that's happened so far. For the inequities that exist in this system, it, it doesn't come from the community board. You guys are not the problem. Um, I just want to make sure that you understand what DHS has done in my time. And my, my, uh, I've kept, I haven't kept quiet internally. People know my stance, but I care deeply about this issue. And I feel like my, my stance has been abused by DHS and by, um, the, the city, not by this community board. So I don't, I want to be very clear that this is not in any way, shape or form, like, uh, uh, uh you know, a complaint on this on the board you guys have done amazing work no, no, no. I'm, I'm not i'm not taking it as a complaint i'm oh. taking it as work with your community board members and get give us the information so we can work as a team 
I never thought we would get out. here, Tom. I never <laughs> thought we would get here, Tom. I want to be honest, Tom. I never thought that we would get here. I never thought I would get to a place where they took advantage of me so, so deeply that I wouldn't be able to like have a, an action. I have an answer for everything, Tom. I'm always ready. I work very hard. Well, you just, they, yo, but they did it to Carol Greitzer. They did it to Miriam uh, Friedland, or they did it yeah. to all those, the, the, um, the great old uh, progressive people in the Lower East Side in the West Village. And then, yeah. then they threw it to Brooklyn. It's, a, yeah. it's like a rolling thunder. <laughs> yeah. So I apologize for not knowing my history. And, and again, no, but we want to, we want to work with you. So you got to let us know what the information is that you have and we'll work with you. Cause you know, Erin is on the board. Erin and I have worked together forever. And she's a smart person who is working on a lot of those issues. She works in the community board area. Um, yeah. and we got it's a really good to, team. It's tough. It's a tough one, but I agree. Um, I want to say, so I want to do this, Tom. I want to apologize for not, not building a coalition to have a, a meaningful conversation about the homeless issue in our community. But I want to be very careful that we don't build a coalition that is anti-homeless or we don't, I wouldn't right. be a part of a coalition whose effort is to shut homeless shelters down. I would be a part of a, a, a coalition that is looking to build equity into the, in the work we're doing. So, um, and, and, you know, my history in this work, Tom, has shown me that most coalitions that are built around homelessness are to stop things from happening. And I'm, I'm and, and again, I, I want to apologize. I think I've read the room wrong um, and have left myself vulnerable and alone in this fight. Um, and I should have been, I should have been better at it, Tom. So I want to. No, I could, I could stir up the other side. Don't you worry. There's people in this room I could get on to get just as aggravated. But the thing is, when a shelter opens, it's the environment of the shelter has to be supported also. And I think the neighborhood advisory board that gets put together has to be one that's there to make the shelter work, not one that's there to try and figure out how to call out its problems. And it has to be a neighborhood advisory board that's on a regular basis working with the shelter um you know i was thinking in my head the economic development committee could um work with the the employment one to find jobs um and various things like that so i mean we want to work together and we do not want to be overloaded i have never been able to get an accurate count as to how many shelter beds there are in community board one and where they all are um you know i don't have the time to wander around and find them so if you've got them all Give me the list. <laughs> I will. You know? I will, Tom. <laughs> I'll get you that list hopefully before that. I think the committee would like to know where they all are too, because I know there's also people who would like to be able to volunteer in those homeless shelters or be able to go to those shelters and offer <laughs> help and assistance. But we don't always know where they are. It's always a surprise. Um, and the fact that sometimes that's a good thing, Tom. Sometimes and, it's a good. And Tom, thing. we can but, send you the the list of of shelters in the community board. Um, those locations are confidential. However, in as as the community board, we are able to share them. Um, in terms of the suggestion of people volunteering, I do just want to reiterate that when that neighborhood advisory committee, the CAB is set up, Yuri will reach out to the board. And certainly if there are members from the community board and also members from the community itself who would like to participate in those meetings, um, we would welcome participation from folks who want to be involved in those conversations and supporting the shelter and supporting the, the relationship between those at the shelter and those in the community because our, our clients are members of the community as well during their duration in the shelter. Um, now, anybody else have questions about 39 Ainsley? And don't leave Antonio. No, I know. I got it. I'm here. I'm here. Anybody have questions about 39 Ainsley? Put your hand up or wave or something like that. Dina, Dina 231. Who's that? Oh, that, is, that was um, Teresa. So she just didn't put her hand down. Maria, Maria, yeah. do you have a hand up? Yeah, I have Marie hand Leonza. Up. Yeah, I was just Yep, I see you. Thank you. I was just wondering if people that are gonna be in the shelter, are they picked? I mean, how do they, uh, is there a waiting list? I mean, how does that, uh, you know, to get 141 homeless people, how did you, how does that come about? Sure, so um, I'll just mention it again. Um, individuals come through a central intake point, 30th Street, uh, Bellevue, 
at which point they're assigned to an assessment shelter and then they're further assigned to a program shelter. Um, that shelter assignment um, is, is good for one year. Um, if there is a reason why a client might be transferred, um, they'd be better served by another program, they have a job and their commute is difficult, there are any number of reasons that we might work with a client to transfer them to a different location. But DHS as an agency is working to assign clients to particular program shelters. So it's not as though an individual um, you know, would walk up to 39 Ainsley, uh, you know, knock on the door and say, I need shelter. If that happens, the Canvas staff is trained in terms of making sure that they're able to connect individuals to shelters so we can go through the process. Um, but we have that centralized intake point. Okay, thank you. And an example of the assessment centers is the one that's over um, on the other end of the community board. The other side of Clay, right. Uh, other questions? I'm looking for hands flapping in the air, anything? Anybody? All right. Um, now I. Oh, Tish, okay, Tish, I see her. Tish, go ahead, Tish. Okay. Is there going to be meeting? Are there going to be meetings with the community as they had been in the past as with as an advisory board if this ever goes through? Because um, most people are going to probably not like the fact that our community is being selected at this point in time when for so many years we fought against this. But at least now we're getting information and directly, and it's not just happening where they you find that you start with 40 homeless men and then it increases and you just couldn't do anything in the past. But will there be an agreement, uh, an understanding, an agreement, a plan that that it will always be at that level, at that number, and it will never increase? Yes, that's, that's correct. And and Canva. Um, will be organizing a community advisory meeting that has regular engagement uh, to share information about the program and to to build community with neighbors. Okay. All right. Um, it's not on the agenda, but I had asked um, Aaron if as part of, since there was gonna be people here from DHS and Aaron was gonna be here, whether we could address some of the concerns regarding the, the uh, shelter that has been put in the pod hotel, um, cause we've had uh, letters to the community board about people on the street and things like that. Um, I just wanna share that the first I've heard of it was in the email to the community board and I attend both the 9-0 and the 9-4 precinct council meetings every month and no one's ever come to the council meetings that I can recall to raise the issues of what's going on Metropolitan Avenue but um, who perhaps we should just know who's running the pod hotel where to get in touch with somebody about the issues there um, what how are people who what kind of a facility is the pod hotel and how can we, you know, we can't be policing people when they're on the street and leave the hotel, but is there any way that the community can work with the, that facility to see that the problems that are happening on the street can be ameliorated? The outdoor security. Sure, so I'm happy to just provide a top line and then I'm not sure, Tom, you mentioned that there were some folks from the community that I think um, are there people questions. So I also see in the yeah. chat, there's, it's, there's some hands up. Yeah, I can never tell what people are here for because you can't really identify people, but I'm going to go through. Should Dana, I pause Dana, on the pod? Did people still have questions on 39 Ainsley? Yeah, let me look because Dana left who was monitoring the chat for me. So somebody else keep an eye on the chat for me. I think it looks like Benjamin has his hand up and then Gina maybe. Yes, it's not in the chat, but I see the hands raised. Okay. Hi, um, thank you, Aaron. Uh, wait, 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 wait. It's not Aaron's meeting. I'm just looking through the chat quickly. She's pointing out who's asking the question. Tom, it's not in the chat. It's it's the hand raised like in the little. No, but Ben Ben also has a question in the chat. So. I'm All right. Well, I'm happy to, to say my question. All right. All right. So I see your hand. Okay, Ben, go ahead. I uh, I just had a, a a question before we move on uh, about the the Ainsley shelter. Um, and thanks everyone for for coming in and for your time. Um. 
I I understand it as an equity issue as as well, and I I do hope that uh, neighborhoods uh, put in their fair share uh, in supporting uh, shelters around around the city, and uh, recognize that that is a uh, racial justice issue, uh, which is similar to other ways that uh, urban planning has uh, disproportionately uh, burdened people of color uh, and poor neighborhoods. Um, but I wanted to know also uh, how we as a neighborhood could support the shelter. Um, I don't uh, I think that houses folks in the neighborhood are a burden. I think that there are our neighbors and uh, deserve our, our support and, and help. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, although we might have other uh, issues with the, the location, uh, what we as North Brooklyn Mutual Aid and as uh, as neighbors can do to uh, make the shelter feel welcome and to, to help them in their operation. I'm going to start, and then if Cambo wants to jump in, I know that at other locations, we've certainly had, um, you know, like a welcoming uh, event or block party, I think, in the time of COVID would have to sort of consider what that looks like. Um, but we've definitely had locations that have done like outside barbecues, um, welcome packets, um, individuals have an opportunity if they need, you know, clothing or toiletry packets to get those from the shelter, but oftentimes the shelter, you know, welcomes donations. But I'll turn it over to Canva to talk specifics about that. I think uh, Aaron hit um, the nail on the head there by what she um, mentioned. We've had some experiences with incredible community generosity and, you know, welcome kits and um, other goods and donations have been um, provided to our clients. We also, in non-COVID times, certainly welcome volunteers um, and thinking that bridging the gap between the community members and our clients is a really powerful way to destigmatize our clients. Um, at times in certain communities, and I'm feeling a lot of support here, and thank you, and Benjamin, I'm gonna research the uh, Brooklyn Mutual Aid Group um, for future. And um, the outpouring of support had sometimes been a little bit of a burden on us. There have been so many different people outreaching to us. So in one of the communities we're in, a couple of the community members said, hey, let us help organize whatever drives, whatever um, you know, you're looking for. So that was really helpful to us. Um, but we can talk through it, you know, through a cab meeting, um, through, you know, future meetings, um, whatever, you know, needs we we have that uh, you guys could help with. But thank you for that offer. And and just uh, Tom, we we threw a we threw a um a welcome dinner at Dar 525 for the hotel. Um, on Metropolitan, when they first got there, they got there around Thanksgiving time, and Dar 525, um, with some fundraising, was able to throw a beautiful Thanksgiving dinner for them. Um, we also do like a Mother's Day at a at a family shelter we had at one point. We did a Mother's Day and took care of all the kids while the mothers had this this spa that we try to do for them. So there are things that we we also coordinate in our office. So um, we're constantly working with them. So we'll also plug you in then. Um, in moments when uh, we're coordinating these things. It's been kind of quiet since COVID. We've done less, uh, but as we move towards like a post-COVID time to some degree, um, our office will continue to do that type of work with these homeless shelters. So um, we'll make sure that we post that up so that if, if there's Ella. opportunities for us to coordinate that we do that. Thank you. Uh, Kevin? Thanks, Tom. Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess just, um, is there a particular email address or, uh, that we can reach out to specifically about this, or I guess, Benjamin, if you want to be in touch with Aaron or folks over there at, the, at you know, that are setting up the shelter, uh, do we have, is there an opening date? Is there a potential opening date? Anticipate, I know we're talking a lot about COVID, but like, I, I you know, as more folks are getting vaccinated, is there an anticipated opening date? Mid to late 21, right? Okay. Sure. All right. Um, yeah, just, I, you know, uh, with the mutual aid, we've been doing support for the BRC men's shelter. We got them like 100 large bags of clothes way back and face shields, masks, PPE um, through the North Brooklyn mutual aid. Um, we've been doing outreach, sustained outreach under the BQE and all around the neighborhood. You all, you all have heard about from Benjamin. Um, we do about 500 care kits a month. 
um, oh, yeah. that go out into the community, um, and we could tailor that to the needs of of the folks that are in the shelter. Um, so, you know, uh, happy to help. Uh, however, um, is needed, and you know, and I I, I do appreciate. Um, I live in District 33. I'm not a, I'm not Antonio's constituent, at least not until he's the borough president. Um, but uh, but I appreciate what he's saying, and I think in the 33rd, you know, we're 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 happy and willing to do our part. Um, you know, so thank you, Antonio, for pointing that out. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, any more little hands? So that's Kevin's hand. Anybody down here? Tina. Why is the chat box so small? Um, I hear somebody speaking. If they want to ask a question, well, can we get a list of the the homeless shelters in the community planning board one that are there now? Aaron's going to get that for us. Can we also get information about other community planning boards, and we can figure out, you know, who's getting the homeless men in their communities and who's not getting them. I believe. Sure. That the last I time that we provided the borough wide information was at last year's borough budget consultations, um, which were provided to the board. We would be happy to update that information and provide it to the board as well. And I would assume that Antonio has been keeping track of the fair share allocations by because it's supposed to go, you know, by community. There's 59 community boards and it's supposed to be spread around all 59 community boards fairly. Well, that's but, what I'm uh, saying. That, that has yeah. never been that has never been my experience. So okay, it's like okay, a, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be. I think by law it's supposed to be that way. Yes. But, um, there's no way to enforce it. So yeah. Yeah. And I don't know how to monitor it, but if we could see what our share is compared to elsewhere, then I think that's what I think that's what Teresa's talking about. Can Tom, we see I what our we share? I think we provided the turning the tide map, which includes those numbers uh, broken down by community district. It includes also the hotels that we're utilizing because of COVID. It's a breakdown of permanent shelters, commercial hotels, which are intended to be temporary that were used prior to COVID, and then a distinction of which hotels are being used for COVID. The board doesn't have that. We'll make sure that we get that to you. Um, but that's something we produce pr fairly regularly at this point um, okay. to show the distribution um, across the city. So many things I can keep in my apartment. <laughs> but if I could have a turning the tide map and I could share it with Teresa and other members of the committee, that would be great. Yeah, okay? we'll make sure we'll make sure you get that. I, they can't possibly know all this stuff. Um. So where were so can we move to the pod, everybody? Send. Yeah. Okay. Wait, what is that sound? It's probably me uh, trying to find a way to use this video. I'm new to this layout and I don't even know if people can hear me, but I, I'm a in the neighborhood of the pod. So you're Jean in the neighborhood of the pod. Okay. Uh, Dana, yes. I'm Dana. I mean Aaron, could you give us a Aaron, sure. could you now let's move into the pod. Great. Um, so the Department of Homeless Services started utilizing the pod um, about a year ago in regards to our de-density efforts um, in terms of slowing the spread in our congregate shelter. Um, so our single adult system is set up in such a way that individuals share dorm rooms. Um, and given the nature and the community spread of COVID-19, it was very important for the agency to act um, very early on to address and mitigate community spread. Um, it was initially done um, by um, um, having anybody who had COVID-like symptoms or tested positive for COVID to be put in an isolation hotel for uh, the duration while they resolve their symptoms, so that way transmission wouldn't spread throughout the shelter. Um, as we learned more about um, COVID-19, um, we continued to employ uh, mitigation factors, including relocating uh, single adults who were over the age of 70, um, and then continued to move across our system uh, as quickly as we possibly could, ultimately moving approximately 10,000 individuals from congregate locations into um, commercial hotels to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Um, the Pod Hotel is one of those facilities. Um, it is the facility that is used as the de-density hotel for our Bedford Atlantic Men's Assessment Shelter. 
Um, so if you remember, uh, once a client comes to intake, they're assigned to an assessment shelter. From assessment, they get signed to, assigned to a program shelter. Um, so these are individuals who, during the point in time of their assessment, um, would be at the pod hotel um, as a de-density to ensure that at the Bedford Atlantic shelter, um, we have the requisite social distancing, again, to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, at the pod hotel, it's fully staffed um, with, with social services staff, caseworkers. Um, we also have security on site 24-7. Um, so that's just the top line. Um, certainly interested in hearing um, some of what the community uh, has to say about this, so we can certainly work to resolve it. We have colleagues from the agency uh, who will oversee the location um, here with us tonight uh, who can answer questions, um, but also to hear your questions and feedback. Uh, can I first, the email that came to us um, is from Fillmore Place Historic Districts, and I don't know if you're familiar with Fillmore Place. It's a block of historic buildings, like a block off of Metropolitan, and they're a very active community and they come to community board meetings, they come to committee meetings. And I don't know if there's been any outreach by them to whoever's running the shelter or by the shelter to them to talk to each other. I don't know that that's ever happened so that they have like a more direct connection to the pod facility and who's operating it rather than having to go to the community board and then we call you up and say, what's going on at the pod? Um, it seems it's that they're gone. concerned about uh, people hanging out on corners, hanging out on the doors, you know, on the steps of their buildings, um, harassing women that are in the neighborhood, um, things like that, which I think if there was a relationship with at least the neighborhood associations, such as Fillmore Place, if an issue comes up that they could work it out. I don't know how that can happen or, you know, if there's anybody here from Fillmore Place that wants to speak directly on that. You're close enough. Do it, do it. Yeah. Whose voice is that? Uh, it's Gina Gornick. <laughs> no, I'm not from Filmer Place, but I I don't know what my fiance wanted me to chime in, but like I don't know if there's somebody here from Filmer Place, but I am friends with um, Nancy, and we've been. Well, you live to in the neighborhood. The... You you live in the neighborhood yeah, of the live, pod. Yeah, I live right next to the pod, and I could hear the um the gentleman through my window, and I have a lot of experiences on a on a daily basis with them. And I did did write letters to uh, Renoso and Levine and everybody I could because I feel uncomfortable every day in my home. And even today we went upstate and I didn't even want to come back. And I've been threatened many times and so have my neighbors and we stay inside until it's like, if it's dark out, we don't go out. And all I'm, I 100% support the homeless shelter. I would love to switch my career and like do not for profit. Like I care about people so much and more than anything else, but I think there needs to be an ounce more of security, like a security outside, because the men leave the shelter and then they go around the corner to in front of our apartment building and they have no eyes on them. And they, they hide knives and they call us names and they like spit and they, you know, like all kinds of stuff. So it's like just that little turn around the corner. And that's not all the, it's like a, just a smattering, but it, it feels unsafe. It is. That's right. I've seen people break glass, hide knives. I've been followed on numerous occasions. I've seen naked butts, you know. Yeah. It's, it's my All right. Uh, so it's quality of life. It's quality of life issues by human it's beings safety. on the sidewalk who happen to live around the corner in the shelter. So yeah. yes, it's, it's have you gone? No security. No, but have you gone to the 90 precinct council meetings or the 94 precinct council meetings? No, this is all new to me. That? I've gone in, I've gone into the pod. I have this the um DHS security um supervisor's number. It's different supervisors from what I understand during the shift. I've called them. Like this is all new to me. Like as it is to everyone, it's only been a year. Okay, so well the, like, the the Fillmore the Fillmore Street people have been around a long time and they usually know who to go to. So I'm suggesting that Aaron, can we find out who's managing that facility and maybe reach out to the community groups and That's establish some kind of communication? So this is a direct run site by DHS. 
Um, right. So in terms of a point of contact, as we've done uh, previously, uh, Yuri, our Brooklyn Borough Director, would be a good point of contact. Um, Gina, if I can call you Gina, it sounds like you're yeah. in direct communication um, with individuals on site, which I think is very yes. helpful because that can provide a, you know immediate response to some of the things that you're experiencing. Um, I have my colleagues um, Yvonne and Cindy on uh, as well. I know that um, the security uh, do tend to do immediate external patrols, but if there's something that we need to speak with the security staff in terms of making sure um, that that happens more frequently or to you know remind them of particular behaviors that are being pointed out to us. Um, these information sessions are very helpful because it helps us learn from the community and again how to be good neighbors. Um, it can also help us in the event um, that an individual um, you know there might need to be a, a reason for a transfer to a different assessment location. Um, so this type of information is very helpful. I want to make sure that you have your information as well. Um, I don't know if if um, Tanya or excuse me if uh, Yvonne or Cindy want to add anything on the security in particular because that's something uh, that you raised. Hi, I'll speak out. I'll speak for the pod. Hi, it's Yvonne Ballard. Um, Who's that? You know, we do we do have security. The security does um, regular perimeter checks around the shelter, um, the hotel. Um, we also, if the client, you know, requires or needs a higher level of care, they are moved immediately. So Yuri would be a point of contact if you are seeing someone that is not being a good neighbor, then it's important to reach Yuri. But the staff that's at the pod um, reiterate to the clients our good neighbor policy about not um, loitering in the neighborhood, not harassing or anything like that. Um, and to be a good neighbor, because if you're not a good neighbor, then we have to move you into a congregate setting. So if you see anyone or can pinpoint like a client that is specific doing this, you can reach out to Yuri and just describe that person to us and that will review with that person. Um, and if the behavior continues, then we'll take, we'll act accordingly. Yeah, I've been trying to get photos if somebody is and it's behaving in a way that makes me feel unsafe. But in that mm -hmm. moment, I'm also very scared. And there's yes. these, it's hard to take a photo without somebody seeing you because they are so in tune to anybody watching them. And I'm just saying them in general, but it's like, it's, it's a balance for me to feel safe and be respectful to get the photos and not be, it's, it's all but, new okay. to me. Gina, Which, Gina, yes. I think you need to like have, Reach out to Yuri. Yuri, you need to speak with Gina and figure That's out a way that this can happen. And maybe, you know, um, some of the folk from uh, Fillmore Place and get a working thing going on over there if that's possible. And I see Yuri that's put her Yuri. email in the chat. And that's Yuri Sanchez? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, but, and again, I'd say they're uh, both the 9 and the 9 4 have monthly. Um, Precinct council meetings and, you know, all of the precincts in the city have been divided up into what are called NCOs, uh, which are neighborhood um, community out outreach officers that you can reach out to and speak to them about specific um, issues in your neighborhood. And then they'll keep a, an eye on it and perhaps talk to the facility or the security people. But like I said, I've been both of the 90 and the 90 for precinct councils, and I've not heard anybody bring this up. Even though the police are not supposed to be dealing with the homeless, if there's a crime issue on the street, if somebody's you know assaulting you or breaking property or something like that, we're not hearing about it. Um, talking about it on the North Brooklyn uh, neighbors page or anything like that doesn't get to the police department. You need to come to the community council meeting. Um, the 90 is the second Wednesday of the month. The 94 is the first Wednesday of the month. The commander is always there. He'll, you can raise your hand. He'll tell you if you want to talk to a police officer confidentially, he'll direct somebody to talk to you in the corner. Nobody has to know what you're talking about. And then they'll work with the security people at that facility to see what they can work out. Great. Thank you. Okay. All right. Anybody else have anything about the pod? Antonio? Uh, Tom, I have my hand up as well. Ben, I, I just got to you, Ben. You're at the top of the list, so there's Ben. 
So, so yeah, I appreciate. So Gina reached You're out next to me after Antonio. <laughs> so Gina reached out to me last week. We got the information, Gina, from Alexis. Um, we reached out to DHS. They told us they were going to be on today and that they could address this issue here. Um, so uh, they, they're handling. I guess they're the, the managing agent here. Uh, we we fought very uh, vigorously <laughs> with the city and the state to ensure the safety of um, uh, shelter residents in the city of New York um, that were being exposed to uh, COVID um, and that were in close quarters. It took a long time for us to get there and um, it, was, it was very late, but eventually we got access to um, hotel rooms where we could separate folks. Um, the Pod Hotel was one of those locations that was um, chosen. Um, I have to, you know, I do, I've been trying to do some work on seeing when I was notified um, of when this pod hotel was used so that I could have been more, I guess, um, attentive to what was happening. Um, and, and, you know, I'm still working on trying to find that correspondence. Um, but again, it was something that we used. It was something I advocated for. Um, and I think that um, it, it helped save lives, uh, but uh, we wanna make sure that whatever, again, anyone that's entering into this community is welcomed, but also that the residents that have been here or that are here are also their concerns are, are addressed. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that there might be an opportunity maybe to to add people to the conversation um, to make sure that the quality of life we're in and around the shelter is high. But I also wanted to ask, what is the timeline um, to keep people at the Bot Hotel? And when can we expect them to go back to their normal um, shelter routine um, safely um, uh, and, and assuming that they're vaccinated and that um, they no longer need to to be separated um, by six feet. Thanks for the question. We don't have a definitive uh, timeline in terms of the return to congregate shelter. We continue to be guided by our colleagues at the Department of Health and follow public health guidance. Um, as soon as a date is determined, we will be certain to come back and share that information with our elected partners and with the board. Um, I know folks are eager to understand that timeline, um, but right now what's most important is make sure that we continue to keep the community spread among New York City residents low um, because that benefits everybody. How many of the residents in this in the hotel have been vaccinated? Um, I don't have that information broken down by hotel um, or shelter, um, but I know that we have vaccinated um, thousands of clients and staff across our system. This is to supplement the effort across the city. Um, so we don't have a total count of fully vaccinated people because individuals can go to a city run site, a state run site and get vaccinated and are not required to share that information to uh, receive shelter as part of the right to shelter. Um, but we, mm -hmm. we we have been um, very aggressive in terms of getting vaccine rollout. Uh, DSS has its own pod uh, where clients and staff can go and get vaccinated. Um, when the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, was available. We were layering that on top of our mobile testing. Now that that vaccine is is uh, good to go again, uh, we're starting up uh, the mobile vaccination efforts again, uh, which is a huge benefit to our clients. One and done. Um, and so we are we are prioritizing making sure that our clients have the option to choose to get vaccinated, and we're encouraging them to get vaccinated, making sure that we're um, providing information about the safety of the vaccine addressing uh, historical you know, injustices in the medical field um, and really making sure that our clients uh, have access to information to make the choice to get vaccinated. All right, um, I would love to have uh, the Department of Health here because if um, you know, vaccination rate is not the determination as to when the pot hotel um, will have these folks move back to, an, um, I guess, a, a purpose-built shelter, um, then what, what criteria are they using to determine when folks should return back? And that's more of a city council hearing question, Erin. So I don't know if you necessarily <laughs> need to answer that right here, but um, at, the next, at the next health committee, I wanna know what determination, what is the determination that makes it so that we feel comfortable moving folks back to the purpose-built shelters? Um, and uh, just if, because if it's not vaccination, because we can't ask, then what what are we what are we using? What if none of these folks have been vaccinated and they all get back? Are we threatening their lives again? Just really want to understand like where like how 
how we're mapping this or how we're tracking it. It's very concerning. Yeah, at the moment, we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to come back to you. I mean, similar to the multi-layered approach that we had in terms of um, asking what are now pretty standard questions in terms of have, have, do, you have, do you have a known exposure? Do you have symptoms? Do you have a temperature? Um, those questions continue to be asked at our facility to make sure that somebody isn't coming into the shelter with COVID or COVID-like symptoms. Our ability to quickly test, to quickly isolate if there is a positive. Um, so it's a, mul a multi-layered process. Um, the Callahan decision outlines uh, very clearly the requirements under shelter. Um, beds are required to be three feet apart. Um, if we have to redesign our single adult shelter system to be six feet apart, we would have to double our current footprint. Um, yeah. So there's a lot to take yeah. into consideration. So uh, we'll be providing an update as we have it. Absolutely. And the, la the last question, Tom, um, <laughs> is uh, what type of services are being provided for the folks in the in the shelter? Is this just uh, like a warehousing model, or are there um, you know mental health access uh, access uh, food models? Just want to know how how the, the residents are being taken care of. Thanks, I'll turn it over to Yvonne to answer that question. There are on-site services that she can speak Hi. to. Hi, so like um, Aaron said, this is an assessment site and the pod is also an extension of the Bedford Atlantic assessment. So these are new clients um, who are coming into our system or, or clients who have been out of the system for more than a year. And so we offer an array of services. So you have medical on site, you have mental health, um, we have teledoc um, lines, we have nurse triage lines that also offer any type of services, mental health care. They're still referred to outside agencies for employment, um, all of that. And then, you know, that assessment period lasts for about 30 days, approximately 30 days or less. Um, we assess them and find out what would be the best shelter that will meet their needs at their current needs to help them move on and to gain independence again. So we will assess them, then move them into what we call a program shelter, similar to how Canberra has with their um, the new shelter. If they're employed or if they're employable, we might refer them or assign them to that site. But definitely there are still services despite the pandemic. Um, <laughs> I want to say that, you know, our staff has done an outstanding job um, throughout this pandemic of coming to work, providing services for those that have been less fortunate. So, Ivana, so I'm sorry. So, I misunderstood. So, this is an assessment center. This isn't necessarily a reaction to the need to separate people from shelters that already exist. And this is the site we're sending them to to make sure that they have their own rooms. This is an assessment center, the same way that we have an assessment center on Broadway in between uh, Rodney and uh, Keep Street. No, so this is this is an assessment. Um, there's Bedford Atlantic. There's a assessment site on Ward's Island. There's McGinnis Boulevard, and there's the assessment shelter uh, at Bellevue. Right. So this is the D Density Hotel that's tied to Bedford Atlantic. So we had to de-densify all of our locations. So McGinnis Boulevard has oh, okay. been de-densified. Yeah, so it's so not, because, a, it's not oh, a new location. It's simply to, again, prevent the community transmission of COVID. Um, yeah, because we had to the also take down yeah. our assessment right. shelters to uh, reduce. Capacity. I see. So the assessment shelters can't take on more people because they need to separate them. And so we need just more spaces to be able to do that work. Okay, That's right. thank you. That's right. All right, thank you all right. for the ben. clarification. All right, Ben, Ben. Um, Your hand is still I, up, Ben. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, if if I could, uh, take us back just just for a moment. Um, thank you for for the neighbors who who shared their experience uh, with some some houseless folks uh, near them. Um, I just wanted to offer a a, a different perspective. Um, what the evidence shows is that houseless folks are overwhelmingly much more likely to experience violence and harassment and abuse themselves than they are to be violent or harassing or abusive to other people. Um, houseless folks are houseless because housing is unaffordable in New York City. And unfortunately, the shelter system feels inaccessible and feels dangerous and feels uh, like an unsafe and violent place for houseless folks. Uh, and they are in the neighborhood because they are our neighbors, even though they might not have uh, the physical structures that keep us safe and well. Um, and it's important, again, for everyone to feel safe. 
Um, but I hope uh, that that sense of safety uh, doesn't come at the expense of other people's safety. And when uh, people call 311 or call 911 uh, or get police or other security involved in houses folks who are in the neighborhood, what's most likely to happen is that they are going to be harmed. They're going to be arrested or they're going to be detained or a sweep might happen in which their belongings are, uh, are destroyed uh, or, or taken. Um, and what the research overwhelmingly shows is that sweeps uh, are dangerous to houseless folks and interaction, uh, unwanted interaction with uh, police is dangerous for them. Um, there's been a number of options in the chat uh, that have been, been uh, uh, offered for bystander intervention training, uh, as well as some ideas to uh, uh, be safe while keeping other people safe as well. Um, the truth is drug users and people with mental health challenges and houses people more broadly are most likely to be victimized uh, rather than to present a danger to anyone else. The reason that houses folks congregate in public spaces, uh, the reason that they exhibit behaviors that are associated with poverty, uh, like uh, a lack of clothing or using the bathroom in public, is because they are poor. It's because they don't have another place to uh, perform those activities in safe and private ways like the rest of us do. And I really think that it behooves us to be uh, compassionate uh, for folks who have uh, less privileges than us, because we know that the cause of houselessness is structural. It is not related to people's individual failings or their uh, inabilities uh, or their uh, bad personalities or uh, whatever it might be. We know that houselessness increases in times of recessions and it decreases in other times. And we can map it to structural features of an economy that is not working for more and more of us and more and more in our neighborhood. Um, and so I really hope that uh, folks will uh, choose not to call 911 or call 311 when they see houseless folks and instead engage in uh, non-police ways of making us all feel safe. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, anybody else who would like to talk or ex their experience at near the Pod Hotel, about the Pod Hotel, questions about the Pod Hotel? Anybody else? Okay. We also had on the agenda um, the committee to discuss the um, Department of Sanitation's inability to keep the neighborhood somewhat clean and. Um, we were told that someone was coming from sanitation, but I don't, I can't tell from the names on the list. Is there anybody here from the Department of Sanitation? No, but I can you're talk here. about that too, Tom. I feel like you're setting me up. Hang Tom. on, hang on, hang on. But they promised they were going to send somebody, but you know, first they said that it was outside their, their working hours and they couldn't come. This was their, their response. The guy's response was, um, uh, brilliant. Um, wow. The, the um, Thomas, it just needs a better union. Point, point, point of information, DHS. No, I'm just kidding. No, Aaron, the, now you gotta talk, your union got to step their game up, Aaron. Unfortunately, the time extends behind beyond my normal shift hours. <laughs> I'll get Hello, you, Tom. You I promise, me? Tom, Hello? I promise you'll have somebody here from the Department of Sanitation at your next committee hearing, 100%. Wait, but we could talk about the problems somebody, now. Somebody's yelling. Somebody's yelling like they hello, want to speak. Hello, Who? hello. It's me. Who is it's this Stephen Caruso from the Department of Sanitation. Uh, Yay. The whole time. Yay! Where are you? Like, you don't have a name on the list. You have a, What are you, on a phone? <laughs> I I apologize. I'm on, the, yeah, I'm on the move, so I'm on the phone. Oh, but I am here. Guy. I am yeah. here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Gio, this is your favorite area, so why don't you... Uh, start us off hello everyone yeah no listen my biggest concern right now is that we have thousands of kids coming back to school along the stretch of the bqe and they have to climb over stuff be it just trash that's being dumped under the highway uh be it like human you know excrement in bottles right uh there's a lot of stuff under there that hasn't been cleaned for years way before whatever's been happening the last couple months. So I'm just concerned about the kids who have to, you know, they're, they're trekking out to school and it's a lot worse than it was a year ago when we shut down. 
So something needs to be done. There's like the soot, the trash, and I'm not even talking about encampments. So before everyone's feelings get to get hurt about the encampments, I'm talking about simple trash that's being dumped under the highway that needs to be dealt with. That is a hindrance for my children, my students, and thousands of other kids that go to school along the BQE that they shouldn't have to deal with the first thing in the morning. Yeah, um, Steve, okay. Steve, there's, yep. so, there's stacks of trucker bombs. I mean, their trucker bombs are just piling up by the, I don't know, whatever. And I think it's like Lyft and Uber drivers have found it's a convenient place to leave their trucker bombs. There's people dragging household trash over there and it's piled up on the sidewalk. It's piled up around the columns. People, and then there's the tires that get left there. And then the storm drains never get clean. So when it rains, we're swimming through that area. Um, and, you know, there are a couple people that are have their tents set up there. There's a couple campers set up there. Um, I don't know if there's a limit to how big the field of property can be around their space. That's something that has to be worked out because a couple of the spaces of stuff have gotten to be the entire parking lot. And I don't know how that can be managed. Um, I don't want to see anybody getting their home removed, but when they're sorting through trash and then when they're done with it, they just throw it in a pile. I don't know if somebody's expected to pick that up or not. It's just, it's so, it just seems there's just so much garbage under the BQE and there's so much road, um, road soot on the sidewalk and in the roadway, the drains aren't clean. It's just, you know, the people, I don't know how the people can stand it who live in those tents because it's just so dirty, um, you know, so Steve. Oh, sure. So uh, first I'd like to, to start by formally introducing myself to the group, uh, Stephen Caruso, Citywide Community Affairs Officer for the Department of Sanitation. Um, so I think that there are, there are several variables which are coming into play. And I, I agree, Theo, that you, you should be concerned if, if your children have to go through this area to get to and from school. Um, but let me, let me start by saying this, that area does not, all of it does not fall under the jurisdiction of the Department of Sanitation. So a lot yeah, of we've heard, that, we've heard that for years. We have heard that excuse for years. And there's supposedly a mayor of this city who can negotiate that. That is the same excuse we hear year after year. It's not your property. Correct. So if it's New York State DOT property, so it does fall, uh, it, it's their responsibility to maintain. Now, with that being said, in the past, we've been able to assist some of our sister agencies and lend a helping hand. But seeing as we took some very big cuts due to, due to COVID, um, it's getting increasingly challenging for us to, to perform any services which are not necessarily uh, that fall under our jurisdiction. As much as we would like to, and I'm acknowledging that, you know, that, that there is a situation there, um, it's a tall order. We are responsible for the portion under the BQE that has ASP. Now, with that being said, we do try and maintain that area, but um, as we all know, there are encampments under there. And anytime that we are dealing with clients, there are a lot of legalities that come into play. And we have to make sure that we don't mistakenly take what people think is trash and it's actually someone's belongings. So therefore, whenever we, we, we get involved with cleaning underneath the BQE, we have to include DHS, we have to include NYPD, they'll actually be the ones to determine what is trash before we can remove it. So, excuse me, you know, excuse me, Ex is... Steve, Steve, yep. we, we yep. as human beings in community board one have been repeatedly told that the NYPD has no responsibility for homeless issues at all. And what we used to use when we do a homeless cleanup. No, we've been told, your mayor has told us that NYPD has nothing to do with homelessness. When we perform a cleanup, DHS and NYPD are on location. Well, but the police are not supposed to be dealing with homelessness and that causes a problem. They will be the ones to determine what is trash. No, it's a police officer's have... job is not to determine what is trash. It's the sanitation department and possibly working with breaking ground and homeless services 
and maybe advocates for the people who are living there to determine what is their property, what is their trash. The police department is Tom, not in the please, business please. of assessing trash. Tom, with all due respect, please state your source for that, because it is my understanding that we do not determine what is and what is not trash when it comes to dealing with clients. So if I just throw stuff on my sidewalk, you won't pick it up unless the police come over and tell you that it's not my property, it's trash? If there was a client living next to it, then no. If we can associate it with possibly belonging to a client, there are a lot of legalities surrounding that. So, so what's the, the solution? Has... So can I, can I interject here? Uh, go ahead, Antonio, because you're going to be the next one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so several several things. Um, I think we can do a lot of the work to clean up under the BQE that doesn't involve being in and around um, the encampments that are there. Um, independent of the encampments, the whole the whole thing is a disaster. Like just just a complete disaster. It's a it's a dumping site at this point um, underneath the BQE. By the way, we've uh, with the community board support, we've tried to completely redesign underneath the BQE so that we can make it a space that could be more conducive to like, uh, you know, a livable environment that has park space, um, more pedestrian space and that we remove a significant of parking to get there. Um, so I just want to say that um, there is a long term vision here um, that this mayor is not going to follow through on. So it's very important that come 2022, we continue to be very aggressive about what we want to see underneath the BQE. But what I think what can happen is it is true the mayor cut a disproportionate amount of funding from DSNY, the Department of Sanitation. It was one of the hardest hits agencies in the entire city of New York. Because of it, this city fell into uh, a huge mess. It was just trash everywhere. Um, there were also, uh, because the businesses were shut down, the private sanitation industry um, was doing um, more work with less clients, being very quick about how they picked up trash in commercial corridors, uh, because they had to get to their next location to make up for the money that they're losing because they don't have as many businesses that are open. Um, it was a perfect storm um, for all the trash that we see. The good thing is that the city of New York is restoring um, all of the money that was taken away from the Department of Sanitation, except for composting, um, back to the department. And in doing so, we expect to see more cleanliness happening in and around the BQE. Now, Steve, because you were generous before in being able to assist sister agencies with the cleanup, should you have funding available to you, do you believe that there is an opportunity here to do a pass um, and help assist this community with cleaning underneath the BQE? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Councilman, for that. I, I, I do appreciate that. And everything that you said is, is accurate and, and absolutely true. Uh, with that being said, I'll say that being that there are so many clients underneath the BQE, and this is such a sensitive topic, um, you know, we, we do have an obligation to keep the city clean, that is true. Uh, and therefore we have to do our best to, to clean up what we can, when we can. And an increase in funding will certainly help for sure. But with, with that, as long as there are clients living underneath the BQE, we still have to be uh, very considerate in the way that we removed some of the quote unquote trash. And we and and Tom, while I know that we are extremely concerned about police interactions with practically anyone um, in this city, um, I think with uh, the appropriate people um, assisting the Department of Sanitation and if um, necessary, this the NYPD. We can get through this. I guess what I'm saying is, Antonio, can you guys give Antonio, me. Antonio, the problem yeah. is that yeah. when your office and Steve's office either are or are not told by the cooperating agencies when they're going to do this thing, and we in the neighborhood aren't told because some of us might want to be over there when it's happening to see that things are working out. Breaking ground might want to be there and make sure yes. things are working out. North Brooklyn mutual aid might want to be there to help work things out. It, 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 because we That's coordinate all been told, we've all been told the police are not supposed to do anything other than police. And then the last cleanup, the police were there. And so that set people off because like, what are the police that we you know we used to in the old days, I'd call community affairs. They put together a team of people, sanitation, health department, you name it. 
and we go there. But the precincts have been told, no, 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 he can't do that anymore. And then when it gets to be one police plaza calling out people to help, it looks like somebody yeah. went to a higher place to override the community's, you know, focus, you know? I just want to, I just want to, Aaron, yeah, can Dan, I get a, Kevin, all of us have been out there for hours, I know, but you know, I know. no sanitation, no assembly member's office, no state senator's office, you know, and it's ASP area. It's the ASP we area. Have, and Tom, Tom, we have, we have been there. So I just want to be very clear. I actually have been there and we have done a cleanup um, over the last year underneath the BQE. It is a tricky area. It is the, the dividing line between council member 11 and my office. So it is. The jurisdiction is also a problem. Like who owns what side? Do you know if I put in the effort? Do I even want to clean the other side? Um, which which I always do, by the way. I always put in <laughs> effort to clean the entire underneath the entire BQE. Um, but I think that this is um, you know an effort to coordinate here is what I'm asking for. An opportunity to figure out or do do this work. Um, I've been getting a lot of trash complaints throughout the city, um, and this is another one. Um, I just want to get an opportunity to be able to coordinate with the Department of Sanitation, the Department of Homeless Services, and really try to figure this out, Tom. Aaron has a question or a statement or a point of view. I think it's a, a point of information. Um, <laughs> so I, I appreciate the the conversation that's taking place, um, and I know that that some of the participants in the meeting, um, Tom, Geo, Benjamin, participated, and that the assembly members, staff, who I believe. Was also on the call, uh, participated in a walkthrough uh, following the, I believe it was the March meeting that we had. Um, we continue to be in touch uh, with our colleagues at DSNY and and Steve. I'm not sure um, if this information has has made its way to you, um, but we have we are going to uh, work collaboratively uh to schedule a cleaning for friday and i think the tone that was discussed um in the meeting in march about working to ensure that we're not displacing the individuals who are under the bqe but also taking care of the fact that there is um the discarded contracting debris there's lots of trash um i was walking under the area um just a couple of days ago i walked there fairly regularly um, and, you know, there is there's a lot of trash that has has been built up. And I think what will be important is um, to be able to communicate with individuals um, DS to follow its normal procedure in terms of uh, the posts uh, that we have. Um, but our goal is to be able to uh, have DHS on site, as we always are, to support and engage the clients. Um, and in in the instance where we've built this collaborative effort, um, I spoke with the assembly member's office earlier today to really make sure that that cleaning goes smoothly. So that way we're not being disruptive to the individuals who are there, but also addressing, um, as has been brought up, the, the conditions. Um, so DHS will be there um, to, to continue to engage uh, the individuals under the BQE um, as we do during joint operations. Aaron, let me ask you this. In the past, when we had to, when we did these, um, cleanups because of the human waste and the needles the health department had to be included because sanitation can't touch the needles and stuff so is health part of this or not tom can i say something about that <clears throat> wait i have aaron's i don't know if aaron was going to answer or not I don't know. i'll let i'll let dsny speak to what they are able to to clean or not i don't know what their machines are capable of well, a lot of this isn't going to be machines. This is going to be like, you know, backhoes at this rate. Yeah, I, I'm, I can't speak too much on the actual operational side. Um, I'd have to circle back around with with my cleaning office and see, uh, you know, what they what they actually have scheduled to take place, as you said, on, on Friday and what type of equipment and, and staffing and machinery we're actually going to have there. Um, so I, I don't want to give a definitive answer tonight. I can I can certainly circle back around uh, Tom with you tomorrow once I have some updates. But I I don't have all the logistical details for the next cleanup, which is going to take place. Uh, Tom, this is Tish. Therese, Tish, Tish, what's your question? Well, I just wanted to say I think that they, the sanitation department tries their darndest 
but there are other issues that they're involved in now. I mean, I had to make several calls about the needles and different uh, things that are close to the tree pits. In the tree pits. In the tree pits. Now, you know, that's like uh, the, the owner of the house of my home. I have to clean that area. So I did, uh, I was informed to call the Department of Sanitation and they would take away any apparatus, any needles or whatever. So they're doing their best in that area. But in terms of the community in general, I think they do their best. Underneath the BQE, that's another issue. People living there and there's a lot of dirt. So maybe they have to address that issue. But uh, I can say that they do their darnest and it's hard work and they try their best. Very unsafe. It's unsafe with the uh, new uh, construction is uh, overwhelming in our community. And uh, the tree pits, uh, they're like the loaded. You know, they're there and people that are on drugs, they throw these needles or whatever, and they're around the tree pit or inside of the tree pit. So that's a lot of work for a community. People that, that don't want to deal with that. They're afraid to handle any of this stuff. Yeah, Tom, what are we supposed to do about that? It's Tish's daughter. We're having such an issue with syringes everywhere. And to go for me to physically clean it, you can be stuck with something. So I had the Department of Sanitation pick one up. But now it's just becoming, there's so much between that and construction sites. There's so much dirt and debris that ends up on our sidewalk that we're being ticketed. Imagine that, like where's the Department of Sanitation? We're being ticketed constantly, good citizens, model blah, and we're being ticketed. It's really a shame. You know? I got sick. I got ticketed the other day for some papers on my sidewalk. So I, I appreciate your pain. That's, that's, why, I, that's why I'm like, what, clean up that, you know, yeah, I don't know what to do with the needles. I can't understand why your tree pit has become the needle tree pit, but uh... it's awful. It's awful. So they put all the debris. They throw trash in there. It's like a receptacle. They throw it in there because the construction next door they put up a barricade around our tree, and people walking around believe that it's a trash receptacle. So, like, you know, we were ticketed. I feel bad. My father's a retired New York sanitation, you know, and and you know, model know. citizen. And he's being, we're being ticketed. So we're, it's just, it just doesn't seem fair. Anyway, I know I'm not supposed to speak. I just wanted to add that. Oh, you can, you're, you're a person, you can speak. I don't oh. know what we can do about the needles, but perhaps uh, I, Steve can has an idea. Tom, could I take a turn at some point too? Yep, I could step in. Yeah, yeah I, I see your hands. Um, Steve, so, what did you say? As for needles and syringes, we do respond to 311 complaints. So if you call in a place of complaints, we will come out and remove them. Um, with that being said, just, just so you know, during COVID, uh, one of the cuts that we took were to the team that actually is trained in needle and syringe removal. Um, with that, we've got some of that, that funding back. So I do anticipate that they will increase the staffing that's actually going on out there and, and removing the needles and syringes. So, we expect that our response time should be a little bit quicker than it has been over over the past year. And Tish, you know that whenever you make a 311 complaint, you get the complaint number and you call it into the office and then Marie or Joanna or Jerry will follow up to make sure that it's getting addressed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we had to do that with the construction next door to us. It's yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. What was the gentleman's name from the Department of Sanitation, please? It's Steve. Where's Steve's last name? Caruso. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes, thank you. All right, Ben. Ben. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to, to begin by uh, asking people to, to reconsider some of the ways that they're talking about drug users. Uh, you know, behind the needles that you see are people who are vulnerable, are people who may be suffering, and people who deserve our care and compassion. The fact is that these are our neighbors and they're not a burden, they're not a nuisance, they're not dangerous to us, and they don't deserve to be talked about like they are a problem to be fixed or to be exterminated uh, or to be removed. Um, and I, I wanna encourage people to support public health efforts that uh, lead to reductions in the harm that uh, drug abuse problems can have rather than uh, criminalizing or stigmatizing uh, or hurting drug users by excluding them from 
the safe places that uh, they can be and can use drugs uh, and uh, can survive. Overwhelming research shows, again, that harm reduction uh, techniques keep drug users healthy, they keep them well, and they lead to the possibility of survival and, and treatment. And what doesn't is criminalizing and, and punishing and, and shaming drug users. Um, so I just really want to encourage folks to uh, think about the, the person, the individual with a, with a family and friends and a, li and a life that matters, uh, who is behind those, those needles um, and who deserves yeah. our, our care and, and compassion. Um, I also wanted to say uh, that the, yes. the garbage problem, uh, you know, and the, the dumping problem under the, the BQE uh, is, is significant, but I would also like to encourage people not to uh, exaggerate or to shift the blame or to scapegoat people who are living under there, who are on the margins of society and are, again, extraordinarily vulnerable. And the kind of attention that this conversation is drawing toward ben, them is ben, harmful to them. Me, ben, so what I would Ben, excuse yes. me, Ben. Yes. We yes. have been talking about yeah. none of us have stigmatized the people in the tents tonight. We are talking about needles in a tree pit, not about the needle users. We do not need a lecture on social sociology right now. We're thank just you, trying Tom, to and get I don't need an interruption. Uh, so I'll I'll continue, but thank you for that. Um, well I could give you three minutes would, and that could be it. Am I the only one who has a time limit, Tom? I haven't given anybody a time limit. I didn't either, think so. So I, I don't think I'll take a time limit myself what? either. Um, thanks, thanks for uh, your comments, Tom. Um, as a, I'll, I'll continue, I think it's important to recognize that there is garbage under the VQE that can be cleaned up. Uh, there is refuse that no one wants. But it's important to recognize that houseless folks under the VQE are not entirely responsible for this and would not be living there and would not be living in the conditions that they live in if they had other options. And I really wanna encourage us to uh, find solutions to cleaning up whatever trash there is under the BQE uh, while being uh, respectful and dignifying and keeping the houseless folks there uh, safe and well. And I'm uh, really glad for the attention uh, that that, uh, um, that that has had uh, already in the in the meeting and, and, and thank you for that um and i just want to uh, clarify also a, a one thing a sweep is being scheduled for this friday is that true friday april 30th uh Aaron, could you yeah a joint operation to clean to have the street sweepers run under the bqe are there uh cross streets that that's going to be between uh, I can certainly follow up. I don't have that information right now. But my oh, my general my general understanding is Meeker from McGinnis to Metropolitan. Is there a time, or do you think that it will happen throughout the day? I think it's going to happen throughout the day. But happy to get back on any details I can provide as I get them. Okay. I just wanted to be able to come to the meeting because it's been a topic of conversation previously to ensure that we were giving the update here. Um, I do. I do want to reiterate that you know sweeps are harmful to houseless folks, uh, and it's uh, disturbing to hear that an organization that is purportedly dedicated to helping them and to sheltering them uh, would engage in these kinds of practices. That again, research shows is extraordinarily harmful, and in fact uh, violates the guidelines that have been updated in March of this year, uh, and include uh, leaving encampments alone if. Uh, individual housing cannot be provided for houseless folks. That's what the CDC says. So a sweep is contrary to current CDC guidelines. It is a violation of CDC guidelines and it's putting houseless folks at risk. Um, but thank you for letting us know. Uh, we will uh, be there ourselves uh, and I, I hope that we can work together to keep the houseless folks under the BQE safe uh, while, yeah, and, there is, while there is and a sweep. And that's that's the goal, as I, I mentioned, if it wasn't clear, is the goal is to not um, not displace the individuals who are yeah. under the BQE. And um, look forward look forward to the partnership in that. Um, thank you. Um, I also just lastly wanted to wanted to say that uh, Northbrook I mean, has a network of, of thousands of volunteers, um, and we can uh, link with many other groups, uh, and we have uh, funding as well, and we're more than happy to. Uh, 
uh, engage in community cleanups. Uh, there are many folks uh, under the BQE who I have uh, developed relationships with and in fact spoke with uh, just today um, who are uh, more than willing to uh, help us uh, and whose permission we have uh, to uh, clean up the trash that they don't want uh, under the BQE. Um, it's not a, a controversy that there is some trash that nobody wants, um, but we're just very concerned uh, that um, what happened at the end of February, uh, where uh, some houseless folks uh, had all their belongings uh, destroyed and, and stolen by uh, the sanitation workers, uh, the NYPD and, and DHS workers, um, that that doesn't happen again. Um, so if we can uh, clean up the BQE in any way uh, ourselves, um, including you know a, a multi-day and very large effort, uh, we're happy to do that. It'll save the city quite a lot of money, um, but we're uh, glad to know that uh, you've let us know when the when the sweep will will happen. So thank you for that, Aaron. Sorry, Kevin? thank you for the ongoing partnership. Kevin, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Benjamin and Aaron and, and, and everybody. Um, yeah, you know, I um, I just I, I appreciate what Benjamin is saying here. Um, I appreciate what Gio is saying here. Um, you know, you know, Tom and Aaron, I, you know, I um, I guess something that I, I want to I do want to point out is, you know, when I have gone, um, you know, we're we're, we're out there. Um, the mutual aid is out there uh, every week uh, walking the BQE. Um, so we see some of the issues that folks are talking about, especially around illegal dumping. I mean, you know, Geo, I, you know, we've talked about this quite a lot, right? Um, that's why I'm, I'm doing the Make Meeker Move campaign. Uh, we're working on it uh, to get those pedestrian and safety improvements um, so that your students can can cross safely and feel safe, and you know, don't get hit by a car or you know any of the awful things that um, that you know we know are problems, right? Uh, like like the soot coming off the highway and washing down in the drains there and the floods. Tom is right. You know, that's something that affects the folks that are in the encampments as much as any of the rest of us, if not more so, because they're living there. Um, you know, and what I will say is, as, as we've gotten to know the folks living under the BQE um, over the course of this work, um, and I, I do think this is important to note because sometimes it gets lost in, you know, in how extreme the situation is. Um, the folks that I have seen cleaning up that space, no offense to Mr. Caruso, more than DSNY, are the actual people who live there. You know, more so than 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 any of us doing an occasional cleanup, more so than the DSNY, it's the folks that are that that are keeping that space clean. You know, not a hundred percent, not a hundred percent of the time. But you know, there's garbage outside my house that I can get ticketed for, just like Tom. Um, so you know, I I do want to keep that in mind um, as we're talking about this. You know, the stuff with the drains and the soot, the pedestrian space, that stuff is really really important, which is why I hope that. You know, on the 11th, when DOT comes and presents their plan um, about this space, you know, uh, I, I know for my part, as not a member that's voting, I'm I'm hoping, Tom, for your support and for Geo's support and for, you know, for Gina's and, and Tisha's, you know, on, on really making this plan the best that it can be and working with everybody. Um, you know, and so, you know, I don't know. I, um, you know, I, I, I am concerned. Kevin. Kevin, um, you notice the stuff that's going on. We need to figure out how to identify what is and what is not trash. Yeah. So um, I, I, something that I the, the debris fields are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and I don't want to be taking people's stuff, but it's just getting bigger. <laughs> well, I mean, this is something that, and this I guess is, this, this is, is why we asked for notice uh, right. so that we and could talk to the houses. Yeah, I, Benjamin, I, I, the guys I, in the tents are always sweeping and cleaning Tom, up, but Tom, then the tents they clean up. They put aside to be picked up by sanitation and never gets picked up. I know right. that they're putting their stuff aside to be picked up like a regular house would have a garbage truck come every two twice a week and pick up their stuff. And so we're they, happy to supply them. We're happy to supply them with bags for their garbage and whatever else that they need. Like that that is that like we're willing to do that. We're ready to do that. We're doing that now. You know, and so I see a sweep and every morning and they set their stuff on the side that needs to go, but it just never gets picked up by anybody. So right. it's, we have to figure that out. And so this is why I guess, and this is not to not to put, you know, Aaron in the hot seat here, but it's like, you know, I, I guess today is Wednesday. It's Wednesday night. You know, this sweep is scheduled for Friday sometime during the day. You know, back in February, we said, you know, the the, the mutual aid is the whole, you know, NBK Essentials is doing this outreach. All the elected offices, all of this, like, 
sturm and drang around you know what happened in february that awful 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 thing that happened to herbie and the rest of those neighbors we said please let us know when you have one of these things planned we can bring the resources forward we are interfacing with these people every single day you know and that we are happy to help like i i just i i don't think that we're setting ourselves up for success on friday by saying in less than 48 hours is going to be sleepers moving through the space I want sweepers to move through the space and to do that work and to take the soot out and to work with those neighbors to get rid of their trash and to get rid of the industrial trash that's being dumped. We have to do that collaboratively. I mean, I, I don't, when were the elected officials notified? This board is being notified tonight of something that's going to happen as early as Friday morning, first thing. Like, that's a problem, you know? And I, I, I oh, think oh. that, like, we want, we want to help. We will take our time, not as, not as elected officials, not as paid uh, members of elected staff, not even as board members, but just as members of the public that want to see this fixed and done right. But we need to be given adequate time to prepare in order to do that. You know, and so, I mean, even the delay of a week in this case would be tremendously helpful so that, you know, Benjamin and his team could do their work in interfacing with the folks that are there to get them prepared, plastic bins for their materials, whatever it is needed. Um, and we could put a team together that could walk through a DSNY and sanitation, sorry, and, and homeless services, and hopefully keep the police out of this instance um, of McGinnis to Metro, which is a massive amount of space, you know. And so I, I, I don't think that I don't think that it's enough time. Um, yeah, I don't think that it has been. I don't think that it's you know honestly that. And I'm not saying that it's disrespectful, but I'm just saying I don't think that it's been. It doesn't track with what we have been asking for and discussing here for several months now, you know? So if I can just I respond, I, I appreciate it. And I think part of this process is one of mutual learning. Um, so the agency's process from a DHS point of view is providing client notice, providing notice to the area where the location is going to be cleaned, irrespective of if clients are known to be there or not. There are times where in response to 301 complaints, we post notice and our staff are not aware of clients uh, locating at that, at that particular area. Um, we have set forth a different dialogue among this community, among the elected officials, um, the mutual aid group. And so part of this is also new in terms of, you know, notice being given, right? So this is an extra notification layer that the agency has historically not done outside of the process. Um, I spoke with the assembly members chief of staff earlier today. I sent a text message to the council member. I've not been able to connect with him. Um, and we're having this meeting tonight. Um, I am happy to go back to our colleagues at the agency to, to suggest that an alternative was presented at the meeting in terms of, of a cleanup. Um, but I think the concern is, and, and if we can, for a moment, allow me to speak as a neighbor instead of a, a, a DSS uh, person and a member of the community board, but as a neighbor, as somebody who, again, like walks under this area um, with, with quite regularity, um, there is, there's, there's a, a gap in terms of um, all the good work that the mutual aid group is doing in terms of providing resources, providing trash bags, those types of things. Um, I have seen members of the community down there sweeping up, cleaning up, um, but uh, there are notable areas um, that are, you know, strewn with trash. And from what I understand from DSNY is their concern about, um, you know, having these large, uh, what are they called, uh, the, the sweepers, um, you know, in an area where <laughs> there are individuals who might be there. Um, but I think they're, you know, we need to figure out how to address the trash and the contracting debris. Again, not talking about the individuals who are down there in terms of um, displacing those individuals. Um, like I said, I'm happy to go back to see if there is an opportunity to, again, continue the work with the mutual aid group. But I think what, what we have seen, what our teams have seen is we have not seen an increase in the number of houseless individuals under the BQE. Um, what we have seen is a significant proliferation of trash, of contracting debris, of mattresses, household waste, and that sort of thing. Um, 
in fact, we've had some progress with our colleagues uh, in partnership with Breaking Ground in terms of having clients accept services um, and come inside, um, which was part of one of the things that we talked about in terms of this collaborative approach to the area under the BQE. But to the to the trash point, um, you know, it is it is out of control. Um, so again, happy to go back. I don't know um, if there's a direct point of contact to communicate either with Kevin or Benjamin. I'm I'm happy to do that if you can drop an email in the chat, um, and you know try to get back to you tomorrow. Aaron, my my concern, I guess. Sorry, if I can just just respond very briefly. Uh, you know, my concern with this is that you know everything going according to plan, and I understand that like you know all these changes that have happened happened because there was a real and it doesn't need to be acknowledged from DHS or from you know from any other agency but there was a real failure of like the stated procedure and it meant that that our neighbor Herbie lost literally everything that he owned um in one of these you know botched encampment sweeps um and so it is somebody's unmuted my phone's not ringing um but hello all right, give me five minutes. I'm still in a meeting. Can you? Yeah, all right. It's, uh, yeah, the set is on, so when you. Mute, okay. mute, please. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, just as, as to say that, you know, to to all be together on this or as close together as we can be, especially after everything that has happened, um, especially when we have the capacity to help, um, you know, I, I, I just think it, it ought to be delayed, um, because, you know, th this is, this is very, very quick. You know, I, I am aware of the issues with the trash and the dumping. Um, I am just, you know, we can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. You know, if there is a mistake that is made because we rush this and we go forward on Friday, you know, we can't give one of these individuals all of their earthly possessions back, right? You know, the the stuff is gone. So I just I hear the I request. Like, I hear the request. I'm happy to bring it back. I just I can't provide that, that answer can, tonight. Aaron, Aaron, I Tom, if that can be a request of the board, you know, here that 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 DHS does wait, um, you know, a, a, a week or so and coordinates with the, the the folks that are organizing on the ground in this space, um, that would be much appreciated. Um, we're willing to do our part, um, but I you know we need a little bit of more than 48 hours to prepare. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Tom, I think I you're, think on, you're mute. on mute. I'm mute, Tom. Hey, is Steve still here? Yes, Russo? Okay, so yeah, your, san your sanitation, Aaron's homeless services, I don't know who else was being coordinating in this, but I guess we'll have to talk about this in the morning to figure out whether we can, if we can get this uh, delayed at least a week so that, I don't know, is breaking ground plugged into this too, Aaron, or not? Sorry, I need to unmute. Um, so DHS uh, is on site for, for the cleanups. No, but, but. When you say DHS, are there people who actually know and work with the the people who are there? Or is like because breaking ground does outreach to those people all the time. Well, breaking right. So ground breaking here. breaking grounds made aware uh, that the sweep is going to happen. Okay. Well, let's see if we can give a little bit more yeah. time yeah. so that North Brooklyn can uh, connect I and will talk to the folk. Reach out, to folks, as I promised. All right. Anything else, anybody? Meeting um, members. Aaron, uh, you have my email address in uh, in some other uh, email threads, but I'll drop it in the chat as as well. Thanks, uh, thanks for bringing that suggestion back to uh, to your colleagues. Thank you. Committee members, anybody? Committee members have any questions or anything they wish to add? Tom, um, would I be able to respond really quickly to something? I need a name. It's, it's Roger Capucci. Uh, respond to uh, it was just a comment that benjamin had made and, and to piggyback off of uh, your response and i'll keep it brief because i know we're we're yeah, yeah, you're, you're a member of the you're a member of the committee so you can speak thank you i appreciate that so 
J just in terms of the, the drug use and the needles, I think that was Trish that was speaking towards that. And I think, Benjamin, no one is certainly trying to, you know, minimize or, or disparage any, any, any drug user. Um, I mean, everyone certainly needs to be treated with respect and dignity. And that goes from, you know, the, the person who's using drugs. Um, uh, and, but it certainly also goes to, you know, their neighbors like Trish, right? Um, there has to be some sort of creative solution where, uh, you know, we can, of course, treat these people with respect and the dignity that, that they deserve, but that shouldn't come at uh, the expense of Trish having to, you know, clean up needles in her, you know, in her, in her garden. Um, and, and risk getting a, you know, potentially a communicable disease if, if she touches it. So I think, I think what, what Tom what was alluding to was, I, I think we just want to come up with some sort of creative solution where, you know, we can, we can treat everyone with respect and, and solve Trisha's problem um, and, and, and just try to, you know, think creatively here and, and, and support everyone, um, you know, in the community. Thank you. Um, anybody else on the committee? Anybody else? All right. Um, the president's going to be speaking in a half an hour for those of you who are interested. So, um, would somebody like to make a motion? Ogden. So, um, it's the end of the meeting, Bogdan, is what I'm saying. <laughs> so, I've Okay, Tom. Okay, so thank you very much, Tom. I would like to make the motion uh, to close the meeting. Thank you. I second that. And all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed to ending the meeting? All right, meeting is over. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a safe night. Um, I'm going to go watch the president. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you and good night. Be safe, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.